In this video, I'm going to discuss the character of Caliban in the light of Prospero's appraisal of him in Act 4, Scene 1, that he is a devil, a born devil, on whose nature nurture can never stick. What does Prospero mean by this exactly, and just how far can we agree with him? Philosophers and psychologists have debated for thousands of years the issue of whether nature, i.e. our genetic inheritance, or nurture, i.e. our environmental influences, is the more important for human development. Can Caliban be described and dismissed so readily as a creature who is born of evil and whom it is impossible to educate? On close exploration, what we find is that Caliban is actually one of the most complex and contradictory characters in the play. One who is capable of the basest of behaviours and yet, simultaneously, of the most eloquent of speeches. A character who is firmly associated with the earth, and yet who consistently speaks in blank verse, never once lapsing into prose. A native of the island who is condemned and punished for behaviour that is not so different to the behaviour of the other so-called civilised characters, which is instead either forgiven, i.e. Alonso's treatment of Prospero, or brushed under the rug, i.e. Antonio and Sebastian's plot to murder Alonso. We need to start by considering who Caliban is and why he is on the island in the first place. In Act 1, Scene 2, employing a literary device known as exposition, Shakespeare uses the dialogue between Prospero and Ariel to introduce the character of Caliban and his backstory. We learn first that he was born on the island, the son of Sycorax, a witch who had been banished there from Algiers for mischiefs manifold and sorceries terrible to enter human hearing. The shocking evilness of her deeds is such that they cannot even be spoken of. Prospero's contempt for Caliban is obvious from the start, as he describes him as the son that she did litter here, a freckled whelp, hagborn. Note his use of animalistic vocabulary in these lines. Instead of describing Sycorax as having given birth, he uses the verb litter. Litter is the word used for multiple animals who are born at the same time, i.e. a litter of puppies. And the word whelp is actually another word for puppy. Prospero clearly sees Caliban as an animal not unlike a dog rather than a human, and, as such, an inferior being. We later find out that not only is there witchcraft in Caliban's blood on his mother's side, but also that he was got by the devil himself upon thy wicked dam, i.e. his father was Satan. So as far as his genetic inheritance is concerned, if what Prospero says is true, he is not far wrong in his appraisal that he is a born devil. Shakespeare goes to great pains to have the various characters describe Caliban's physical form. Prospero himself describes him as not being honoured with a human shape and that he is freckled. Freckles, during the medieval period, were considered witches' marks and so his breeding can be seen just by looking at him. Trinculo finds it difficult to tell whether he is a man or a fish. A drunken Stefano takes him for a moon calf, a deformed monstrosity believed to have been produced by the effect of the moon at the time of its birth. And Caliban says of himself that he has long nails with which he is able to dig for pig nuts. When Alonso describes him as a strange thing as e'er I looked on, Prospero responds that he is as disproportioned in his manners as in his shape. It's useful at this point to compare Miranda's words on her first meeting with Ferdinand. When Prospero accuses Ferdinand of plotting to overthrow him, Miranda, as Prospero knows she will, jumps to his defence, claiming that there's nothing ill can dwell in such a temple. If the ill spirit have so fair a house, 
good things will strive to dwell with it. Miranda is expressing here a conventional notion of Renaissance neoplatonic philosophy. That the beauty of a person's spirit is inseparable from the beauty of their physical form. If we apply this same logic to Caliban, it's clear that Shakespeare intends the evilness within him to be manifested in the grotesque nature of his outward appearance. When we look a little later at what Prospero means by nurture, we will see that when he refers to nature, he doesn't only mean Caliban's breeding, but also his formative influences on the island before he and his daughter arrived. Miranda, when retelling their shared history for the benefit of the audience, reminds him that when they first discovered him, he did not know thine own meaning, but would gabble like a thing most brutish. In other words, he did not possess language. It's interesting to note that for Miranda, the ability to speak is what separates and elevates us from mere brutes or wild animals. We learn that not only is his nature reflected in his physical form, but also in the way in which he speaks and the way in which he acts. Born of evil and brought up at least for a little while by his mother before her death, the natural world of the island has also been a huge influence on him. In one of his very first speeches, Caliban curses both Prospero and Miranda, invoking the spirit of his dead mother. As wicked dew as e'er my mother brushed with raven's feather from unwholesome fen, drop on you both. A southwest blow on ye, and blister you all o'er. His language elsewhere in the play is also very much of the earth, as he talks of bogs, fens, flats, and animals such as apes, hedgehogs and adders. Although he speaks of these in the elevated form of blank verse, which is usually reserved for the characters of a higher social class. Caliban also appears capable of the basest forms of animal behaviour, as Prospero accuses him of having sought to violate the honour of my child. In other words, of having attempted to rape Miranda. Caliban appears to have no remorse for this heinous act either. In fact, he instead regrets that he was unsuccessful in his mission, as he responds with a chuckle, A ho, oh ho, would have been done, thou didst prevent me. I had peopled else this isle with Caliban's. Not only this, but he also plots to murder Prospero so that he can be rid of him. The language he uses to encourage Stefano to carry out the act for him conveys his own animalistic pleasure at the thought. There thou mayst brain him, having first seized his books, or with a log batter his skull, or paunch him with a stake, or cut his weasand with thy knife. There certainly seems enough evidence so far to suggest that Caliban has an evil nature, but now we need to consider what Prospero means by nurture. We understand nurture to mean a person's upbringing, their education and their environment, be these positive or negative influences. But Prospero seems to have a narrower definition. For him, it means the so-called positive influences of education, culture and morality, underpinned by language, of the Western civilised world, and it is the absence of Caliban's behaviour being informed by these that leads him to declare him uneducable. It would seem that Prospero was expecting, through merely teaching him language, to have taught him so-called civilised behaviour. After considering how realistic this was as a goal in the first place, and what Prospero has actually succeeded in teaching him, we'll take a look at just how problematic the notion of civilised behaviour, according to Prospero's criteria, actually is. We can argue that Prospero's goal was not realistic at all, he seems to equate language and knowledge with morality, i.e. that possessing the former leads inevitably to the latter. Morality, or the knowledge of what is right and what is wrong, is, however, like language, a human construct, in that killing, for example, is only wrong 
because we as humans have made the conscious decision that it is. The possession of language is necessary for us to develop a moral sense, but it is not sufficient. In other words, this can only develop through our experiences of growing up in a society where we are explicitly taught, using language as a medium, that the needs of others have to be respected to avoid anarchy, and that this is good. Caliban, however, hasn't grown up in society. He has spent his formative years living alone like an animal. Animals are amoral in that they exist outside of a moral framework. They act on their instincts and impulses without thinking of the consequences for others. When a tiger kills a person, it is acting amorally. When a person kills another person, on the other hand, they are acting immorally because they are aware that what they are doing is condemned by society. Expecting Caliban to have a fully developed sense of morality from having simply taught him language is just plain naive. So using this logic, can we argue that Caliban's attempt to rape Miranda is amoral rather than immoral? Possibly. But this could be problematic in the context of this speech by Caliban from Act 1, Scene 2, where he clearly communicates that he believes that Prospero and Miranda have acted immorally against him. This island's mine by Sycorax, my mother, which thou takest from me. For I am all the subjects that you have, which first was mine own king, and here you sty me in this hard rock, whilst you do keep from me the rest of the island. Caliban feels that he is the rightful master of the island, having inherited it from his mother, and is aggrieved that Prospero and Miranda have not only taken control of it, but have also effectively shut him out of it. His outraged reaction is evidence that he is not completely devoid of a sense of what is right and what is wrong, even if it is rudimentary and limited to his own perspective. If we look at the definition of nurture more widely, in terms of it including negative as well as positive influences, we can see that Prospero and Miranda have actually taught Caliban a great deal, both deliberately and unintentionally. The most important thing that they set out to give him is of course language. Caliban admits that when they first arrived on the island, thou strokest me and made much of me, would give me water with berries in it and teach me how to name the bigger light and how the less that burn by day and night. And then I loved thee. Note how Caliban's words here demonstrate that not only is he capable of acquiring knowledge, but also of responding to acts of kindness and experiencing finer feelings, such as love. Miranda, fiercely condemning him in Act 1, Scene 2, reveals that she took pains to make thee speak, taught thee each hour one thing or other, but that it was that thy vile race had that in it which good natures could not abide to be with, i.e. that giving him language was not sufficient to make him a good person. Caliban sums up the irony of the situation when he declares, You taught me language, and my profit on it is I know how to curse. The Red Plague rid you for learning me your language. In Act 3, Scene 2, when Stefano and Trinculo were spooked by the sound of Ariel's otherworldly music, it is Caliban, however, who delivers the most eloquent speech in the play. Be not afeard, the isle is full of noises, sounds and sweet airs, that give delight and hurt not. Sometimes a thousand twangling instruments will hum about mine ears, and sometimes voices, that if I then had waked after long sleep, will make me sleep again. And then in dreaming the clouds me thought would open and show riches ready to drop upon me, that when I waked, I cried to dream again. Not only does this speech, which is filled with a poetry that is completely lost on the drunken butler and jester, demonstrate that Caliban has learnt much more than the ability to curse. 
but it also reflects his intense love and sensitivity for his island and his capacity to be touched by the natural beauty of his surroundings. Prospero and Miranda's nurturing of him has also unintentionally taught him resentment and hatred, which are the product of a love and trust that have been betrayed. It's beyond their comprehension that, even though Caliban's attempt to rape Miranda was unacceptable, the moral response on their part would have been to attempt to teach him why it was wrong. But rather than doing this, they reject him outright and subject him to continual physical torment giving him no opportunity whatsoever to learn anything positive from what happened. The negative influences of their nurture certainly seem to have stuck in this incidence. Miranda herself acknowledges in Act 1, Scene 2, that she endowed thy purposes with words that made them known. In other words, she gave him the language with which he could articulate his intentions and objectives and make others aware of them. The grudge that he bears leads him then to plot a murderous coup and, using the very tools that Prospero and Miranda have given him, to recruit Stefano and Trinculo to carry out his plan. If we reflect on the behaviour of the other characters in the play who have presumably experienced the kind of nurture that Prospero had intended to give to Caliban, can we see any irony at all in his project to civilise him? Do they exhibit behaviour which is any more moral than Caliban's? Prospero's obsession with learning and his consequent negligence as far as matters of state were concerned is what lost him his dukedom in the first place. His own brother, Antonio, sensing a power vacuum, was prepared to murder him for his title and is instrumental in persuading Sebastian that he should commit regicide by murdering Alonso. Sebastian, convinced by Antonio's arguments, declares, Thy case, dear friend, shall be my precedent. As thou gotst Milan, I'll come by Naples. Draw thy sword. One stroke shall free thee from the tribute which thou payest, and I, the king, shall love thee. Similarly, Prospero, outraged at having been usurped himself by Antonio, thinks nothing of committing the same crime, by usurping the inferior Caliban and taking control of the island. If we now listen to Caliban's words in the context of these behaviours, I say by sorcery he got this isle, from me he got it, if thy greatness will revenge it on him, for I know thou darest, but this thing dare not, thou shalt be lord of it, and I'll serve thee. How different actually are Prospero, Sebastian and Antonio to Caliban? Caliban certainly sees Miranda not only as a sexual object in terms of his own gratification when he seeks to violate her, but he also sees her as a commodity which he uses to barter for Stefano's collaboration in his assassination plot. She will become thy bed, I warrant, and bring thee forth brave brood. Ferdinand may be genuinely in love with Miranda and want to make her his queen, but she, likewise, remains a commodity nonetheless. The amount of stage time given to Prospero's concern that Ferdinand may break Miranda's virgin knot before all sanctimonious ceremonies may with full and holy rite be ministered indicates that Ferdinand's desires are not so dissimilar to Caliban's. Prospero's threat that should Ferdinand seek to take her virginity before the wedding, no sweet aspersion shall the heavens let fall to make this contract grow, but barren hate, sour-eyed disdain and discord shall bestrew the union of your bed with weed so loathly that you shall hate it both. Is met with Ferdinand's own response that, as I hope for quiet days, fair issue and long life, with such love as tis now. The murkiest den, the most opportune place, the strongest suggestion our worse a genius can, shall never melt mine honour into lust. If we look carefully at his language, we can see that Ferdinand's acquiescence comes more from his desire to lead a quiet life, 
without the consequences of Prospero's wrath falling on his head, rather than from any sense of morality. So has Caliban learnt anything by the end of the play? He certainly learnt a great deal about human nature. He's less naive in that what he's learnt, through being humiliated, is that people can be fickle and duplicitous, and he is certainly a lot more humble than he was at the beginning. When Prospero dismisses him, sending him off to trim or decorate his cell, he responds, Aye, that I will, and I'll be wise hereafter and seek for grace. What a thrice double ass was I to take this drunkard for a god and worship this dull fool. Whether or not this is likely to be a permanent change in him is irrelevant, as he's left behind alone on the island at the end. In conclusion, we can argue that Caliban is certainly not uneducable, and aspects of his experience of being nurtured can definitely be argued to have stuck. His command of the English language is as eloquent as Prospero's, and more so than any of the other characters in the play. And he has also shown the ability to respond to kindness, to feel love, and to learn resentment and hatred when that kindness is withdrawn. If, however, by nurture Prospero means morality, then he's right insofar as Caliban shows no remorse for his behaviour towards Miranda, and would probably act in the same way again, given half the chance. Does he plot to murder Prospero, though, because he is inherently evil, or because he has learnt that human nature is prone to betrayal, and that he needs to do this for his own survival? Let's not forget that other characters such as Prospero, Antonio, Sebastian and Alonso have much less of an excuse for their own immoral behaviour and for their ultimate acceptance of it in other people. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments section below and I'll do my best to answer them. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more videos on English language topics and exam techniques and English literature texts.